controversy over Diederich and Synanon has been growing for several years. Diederich seems to have changed and changed the organization as well. Terry Drinkwater has a background report. When Diederich founded Synanon in the late 1950s, the organization was hailed as a constructive, self-help, drug and alcohol rehabilitation center. Group dynamics, discipline, and the force of Diederich's personality brought sobriety and successful withdrawal from heroin and other drugs to hundreds of followers. Synanon grew, eventually becoming a $20 million business, supported through its own profit-making farms and small industries, and by generous contributions. With success came others, middle-class people, professionals, non-alcoholics, non-addicts, who simply sought a different way of life. They found it in Synanon. Diederich, many former members now say, changed too, becoming more authoritarian. He ordered that all male members undergo vasectomies, that women and men shave their heads, that members change partners, swap them for new mates. Last winter, Diederich claimed an unflattering article in Time magazine had provoked threats on his own life. We never start anything. We never do and never had. But... Nobody is going to mess with us. Nobody. Many of those members of Synanon who left around that time say the organization was changing radically. We talked with a man today who was part of Synanon for 13 years. I believe that it's become an un, uh, gone away from its nonviolent principles and become an organization that will use violence. And what of Diederich? What kind of a man is he? He was the force behind Synodon. He was uh, an executive in the Gulf Oil Corporation who became an alcoholic, a great salesman, a very fine manipulator of, uh, of ideas and people. Do you think that and Dietrich would be capable of leading a mass suicide within Synodon? I don't know, but I think that he could lead people anywhere that he wanted to. I think he's that forceful a human being. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Los Angeles. The United States all but eliminated the draft system in 1975. And today, according to Congressman Melvin Price, there's a well-founded fear that we won't be able to get the needed manpower together quickly enough in case of a national emergency. Price bases his conclusion on a new congressional study. It says Selective Service would need at least 65 days to get draftees out of their civilian clothes and into uniform. A congressional hearing on religious cults, described as an informal hearing, gets underway tomorrow on Capitol Hill. It's been denounced by the Unification Church, the so-called Moonies, and by some others as an attack on religious freedom. Meantime, Congress has been looking into the assassinations of Representative Leo Ryan and the deaths of more than 900 members of the People's Temple in Jonestown, Guyana. Since matters of this kind revolve around the First Amendment, which guarantees freedom of religion, certain questions arise. How far should government go? Where should the line be drawn? Steve Young begins his report with a look back at a parent trying to bring her daughter out of a cult experience. Something has happened to your brain that's changed your whole attitude about people, relationships, families. It's changed your, your, your whole intelligence. It's changed your intelligence so that you don't think that one thing, you can say anything you want, it doesn't mean anything to you. Answer without... Will you answer? Can you answer without deceit? Can you answer without deceit? Can you say, my God in heaven, I can answer a word that means something? My words don't mean the same as yours. They damn well better. Honey. It has been five years since honey. Kathy Crampton was deprogrammed. Oh, what, what has he done to you, honey? What, what has living in that family done to you? The deprogramming followed her forced removal from the fundamentalist church of Armageddon in Seattle. The abduction was supervised by her parents, who were convinced their daughter had been brainwashed by a cult. Seattle police knew in advance of the planned abduction, but took no action to prevent it. She tried to escape twice. During the long trip to the Chula Vista, California home of deprogrammer Ted Patrick, other authorities saw what was happening and did nothing. She underwent about 100 hours of deprogramming and finally, behind closed doors, an exorcism leading to apparent success. 
<laughs> you look like Kathy again. Yeah. But the next day, July 4th, Independence Day, she escaped and returned to the Love family. Like all members of the Love family, Kathy takes the last name Israel. For her persistence in resisting the programmers, the family's leader, Love Israel, decided to call her Dedication Israel. What's happened uh, in your life in the last five years? Oh, a variety of things. I've lived in several different places in Alaska, and I've done some harvesting in eastern Washington, and most recently lived in Hawaii. Just kind of... Uh, maintaining our life and building a sanctuary and just creating my ideals, living my ideals. Are you happy? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy living her ideals with her husband, Helpful, and hundreds of her brothers and sisters who say they base their beliefs and lifestyle on the Bible. Some of those beliefs have changed over the last five years. <laughs> Five years ago, Love family members said they were 66 years older than their actual age. How old did you say you were? I'm 85, sir. You're 85. Would you say the same thing today? Well, I don't think, I mean, I, she's like, I would call her my mom. She is my mom, you know, but also I have a spiritual mother, and that spiritual mother is a vision of peace, and uh, that's my, that's my true understanding, my true mother, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't refuse her the respect of calling her my mom, because I know it means a lot to her. How old are you? Well, I'm eternal. Mr. and Mrs. Crampton have become full-time anti-cultists as a result of their experience in 1973. We honor Leo Ryan, who was a wonderful congressman, and the newsmen who lost their lives in Guyana. They are leaders of the West Coast-based Citizens Freedom Foundation and have met many former cult members. We've had to come to a conclusion that something happened to them, and if people want to call it brainwashing, then you can call it brainwashing. If you want to call it persuasive coercion, you can call it that. If you want to call it mind control, you can call it that. But it is a fact, and it does happen. These people should be responsible to our civil laws and to our criminal laws. Dedication Israel's parents are more uneasy than ever. She is expecting Helpful's child in May and has already had a miscarriage. The Church of Armageddon rejects most forms of traditional medicine and prefers faith healing, the laying on of hands. Six years ago, two members died after sniffing an industrial solvent, a religious experiment which the group has since abandoned. When we were there this time, we saw just one telephone and no mirrors. Dedication's parents say the result is that Love family members know the face of their leader, Love Israel, better than their own. We just thought we could do a better job of being each other's mirrors for a while until we got to know each other. And it, it worked. We're good. What about eyeglasses? Your, your family members don't wear them. Is that safe? Uh, well, I think so. I think, uh, even, I think even the people, doctors in the world see that if people really exercise their eyes, and uh, they can uh, cure them. In the last five years, the group has created a non-profit foundation and says the family has doubled in size to 300 members. They are building love a new house with family funds. On joining, they give all their worldly possessions, in the case of one convert, $300,000. There are about 80 young children of Love family members. Love says nine of them are his. Although the family owns several houses in Seattle, most family members live on a 300-acre ranch in the rolling foothills of the Cascade Mountains. Outside the Love family's front door inn, the Church of Armageddon shares its harvest with neighbors on Seattle's Queen Anne Hill. To many outsiders, it looks like goodness and generosity. But cult critics cite a sinister side revealed in the darkness of the early morning. 4.30 a.m. By this time every morning, the adults have been awakened. For what? Church elders say for songs of faith in the Bible. And later, quiet meditation while the children are still asleep. But is it a form of mind control, keeping church members fatigued? 
isolated and in ideological lockstep. Church doctrine. Love Israel represents Christ and God as the final word in all matters concerning the church by the total consent of all members. Love Israel took the place of Christ and of God. And I believe that every word that came out of his mouth was of God. It's such a complicated thing. It, it's, I mean, he harms their lives How? without even realizing it. Because of this dependency upon him, they're not able to develop their, their total potential as a person. Larry Israel, ironically, that's his real name, rejected the Love family after his parents arranged for his deprogramming. Following the deprogramming, he fell apart, wound up in four mental institutions, and underwent shock therapy. While institutionalized, he wrote tortured letters to his parents. Mommy, mommy, come. I need you right now. Mom, dad, help. I am dying. Dear mom and dad, I am crying and crying as I write this. It hurts, hurts, hurts. When my sister was in there, when, when she came to visit me, she asked me if I would kill for Love Israel. And something in me just couldn't answer that question. And the way I came out was, oh, he wouldn't ask me to do that. But if he did, God only knows what I would have done. But if you begin to believe that a man speaks the word of God, then you'll do what he says. How much control does he have over your life? As much as I give him, which is I give him my life. So. But it's the same as I give my life to God. Some of the people who say, that, uh, if to be very pointed, you were to become suddenly uh, ill mentally, mm -hmm. that uh, you could lead these people down the road to something disastrous. Well, I feel my brothers keep me balanced. I feel we all know the same truth. We all had the same visions. and. I feel we all saw Jesus Christ uh, together, and we've all seen God, you know, we all know that uh, we're one, and we all know that love's the answer. Kathy Crampton's parents have terribly mixed feelings this weekend. They are euphoric. Another daughter has just given birth to their first grandchild. But they are desperately worried, too. Because of the Love family's practices, they fear Kathy or her child could die. Kathy and the other Love family members seem content. They say belonging to the Love family gives them, most of all, a sense of togetherness. In the end, of course, the issues are whether they get more than they give up and whether anybody has the right to intervene. Oh, my God.